femoral stretch test. With the patient lying prone, the knee is slightly flexed and the hip is passively extended by the examiner. Pain felt in the anterior thigh is indicative of increased tension in one of the roots comprising the femoral nerve, L2, 3, or 4. Remember that the patient's response to these tests is subjective, and it is wise to do all of the tests in order to confirm the response. Note that the tests merely indicate that nerve root tension is present, but do not localize the lesion any more precisely than either it being of sciatic or femoral root origin. Sensory examination. The following points must be noted on sensory examination. Explain to the patient precisely what is going to happen and during testing, the patient should have the eyes closed. It is essential that each dermatome be examined separately and compared to its opposite. The patient's response to pinprick, sharp, blunt touch, dull, and light touch, yes, must be examined and further examination of temperature, hot, cold. Two point discrimination, two, two. Vibration, yes. Proprioception, up, down, and deep pain may be indicated. Yes. If any deficiencies of the sensory examination are noted, record these on a diagrammatic chart showing the dermatome distribution and depict the localization and area involved so that this can be used for future comparisons. Motor examination. Essential points in the examination of the motor system include the following. Examine each specific muscle or group of muscles when the individual muscle function cannot be isolated. Always palpate the individual tendon or muscle if possible. Record the strength of the muscle or group of muscles being tested on the zero to five rating scale. Always compare one side to the counterpart on the other extremity. Examine all of the foot and ankle dorsiflexors with the knee in a bent position, such as the sitting position. Examining in a position with the limb extended may produce sciatic pain, which will interfere with the results of the examination. In testing for muscle strength, unless an obvious weakness has been noted previously during the examination, it is best to test against full resistance or grade five power then work backwards if weakness is detected. Foot and ankle extensors. Extensor hallucis longus, L5, deep perineal nerve. The patient is instructed to extend the big toe and the examiner then attempts to flex the big toe. It is necessary to apply pressure distal to the interphalangeal joint in order to test only the extensor hallucis longus and not the extensor hallucis brevis. Extensor digitorum longus and extensor digitorum brevis, L5 deep perineal nerve. Instruct the patient to extend the small toes and apply pressure to the dorsal aspect. The examiner should not be able to plantar flex the toes under normal circumstances. Tibialis anterior, L4, deep perineal nerve. The patient is asked to invert and dorsiflex the foot. Obviously, the patient cannot be expected to understand these instructions 
and by placement of the examiner's finger in the proper position and asking the patient to touch the finger with the big toe, the ideal position can be achieved. Pressure is then applied to the medial border of the foot, attempting to plantar flex and evert the foot. And with the other hand, the tendon of the tibialis anterior can be palpated by the examiner. Foot and ankle plantar flexors. Flexor hallucis longus, S1, tibial nerve. The patient is asked to plantar flex the big toe, and the examiner attempts to dorsiflex the toe. Note again that the examiner's resistance is applied distal to the interphalangeal joint. Flexor digitorum longus, S1, tibial nerve. Instruct the patient to plantar flex the lesser toes and attempt to extend the lesser toes, which should not be possible in the normal patient. Tibialis posterior, L5, tibial nerve. The patient is instructed to plantar flex and invert the foot. While applying resistance to this motion, the tibialis posterior tendon can be palpated behind the medial malleolus. Perineus longus and brevis, S1, superficial perineal nerve. The foot is brought into a position of plantar flexion and eversion by asking the patient to touch the examiner's finger held in the appropriate position. Pressure applied to the lateral border attempting to invert and dorsiflex the foot will allow the muscle function of the perineus longus and brevis to be graded. Gastrocnemius soleus complex, S1, S2, tibial nerve. Because the gastrocnemius soleus muscle is the strongest in the body, significant weakness has to occur before it can be detected by the examiner applying resistance. The gastrocnemius soleus should therefore be tested actively, as in toe walking and in the ability to do 10 toe stands. During toe walking, look for partial sinking and inversion of the heel or during toe stands, look for decreased speed of performance as well as fatigability. During toe stands, it is essential that the knee be kept straight. Knee extensors, quadriceps, L2, 3, 4, femoral nerve. The quadriceps muscle must be tested as a group. The patient is in the sitting position and instructed to extend the knee. One hand of the examiner stabilizes the thigh and palpates the quadriceps contraction, while resistance is applied by pressure just above the ankle joint to the lower extremity. Hip flexors, iliopsoas L1, 2, 3, femoral nerve. With the patient sitting, the hip is further flexed against the examiner's resisting hand. Obviously, it is not possible to palpate the iliopsoas muscle or tendon. Hip adductors, L2, 3, 4, obturator nerve. Primary, adductor longus. Secondary, adductor brevis, adductor magnus, pectineus, gracilis. With the patient lying in the supine position, the leg is abducted, and by stabilizing the pelvis with the forearm, the patient is instructed to bring the leg towards the midline. Resistance is offered by the examiner by pressing against the medial aspect of the lower leg. Hip abductors, L5, superior gluteal nerve. Gluteus medius, gluteus minimus. The patient lies on the side and the uppermost leg is abducted. Obviously, if the patient can do this, at least a grade three muscle power is present. Resistance is then applied to the leg by the examiner and the abductor region is palpated. Care must be taken to assure that the patient's hip does not externally rotate or flex to avoid any contribution by hip flexors or the tensor fascia respectively. Knee flexors. Hamstrings. Medial L4-5, lateral S1-2, sciatic nerve. The patient is instructed to flex the knee to approximately 60 degrees while lying in the prone position. 
The examiner offers resistance by applying pressure behind the ankle and with the other hand stabilizes the thigh and palpates the hamstring muscles. Hip extensors. Gluteus maximus S1 inferior gluteal nerve. With the patient still in the prone position and the knee flexed to 90 degrees to eliminate any contribution to hip extension by the hamstrings, the patient is then asked to extend the hip and resistance is applied on the back of the thigh while the other hand palpates the region of the gluteus maximus or buttock. Abdominals. T5 to T10 above umbilicus T11 to L1 below umbilicus. The patient lies in the supine position and is asked to perform a partial sit-up. The abdominal muscle is palpated to assess tone. If all four quadrants of abdominal musculature are normally contracting, the umbilicus will remain stationary, whereas weakness of one or more of the quadrants will be manifest by movement of the umbilicus towards the stronger quadrant or quadrants. This is known as a positive beaver sign. Although some examiners may test all the muscles of a single root, for example, L5, extensor hallucis longus, extensor digitorum longus, tibialis posterior, and gluteus medius, I prefer to proceed up the extremity in a systematic fashion as has been described during this examination. Reflexes. There are three types of reflexes that the examiner attempts to elicit during the neurological examination. This is really the only part of the neurological examination which is objective and does not rely directly on patient cooperation and response. Deep tendon reflexes. A direct anatomical arc is involved in the deep tendon or stretch reflex. The essential elements are the stretch receptor, afferent nerve fiber, a synapse in the spinal cord, an efferent nerve fiber, and a muscle end organ. The deep tendon reflexes can be modulated but not directly controlled by impulses from the brain. The absence of a deep tendon reflex would suggest interruption of the reflex arc. Nerve root pressure insufficient to completely disrupt the reflex arc will result in a decreased or hyporeflexic state. Absence of cerebral or upper motor neuron regulatory control will eventually result in a hyperreflexic state. Superficial reflexes. These reflexes require skin stimulation and are mediated through the central nervous system. The absence of a superficial reflex in conjunction with an increased deep tendon reflex is strongly suggestive of an upper motor neuron lesion. Pathological reflexes. These are also superficial reflexes mediated through the central nervous system. The significant fact is that they are present with an upper motor neuron lesion, whereas normally they would not be elicited. Therefore, in upper motor neuron lesions, the superficial reflexes will be absent, while the deep tendon reflexes are increased and pathological reflexes will be present. Deep tendon reflexes. Patellar tendon reflex or knee jerk, L2, 3, 4. With the patient sitting over the edge of the examining table, locate and tap the patellar tendon with the reflex hammer. This can also be done in the supine position by flexing the knee slightly to put the patellar tendon on slight stretch. Achilles tendon reflex or ankle jerk, S1, S2. With the patient sitting, passively dorsiflex the foot to the neutral position and tap the Achilles tendon. 
A plantar response indicates an intact reflex. In the supine position, the patient can cross one leg over the other and with dorsiflexion of the foot again to neutral, tap the Achilles tendon. The reflex can also be elicited with the patient in the prone position and the knees flexed to 90 degrees or with the patient kneeling on a chair. Under normal circumstances, the ankle jerk and the knee jerk can be detected easily. They may, however, require reinforcement, such as having the patient try to pull clasped hands apart in order to elicit the reflex. Posterior tibial tendon reflex, L5. The posterior tibial tendon is tapped with the reflex hammer either just behind the medial malleolus or just proximal to the navicular tuberosity. Inversion and plantar flexion indicate the presence of a posterior tibial tendon reflex. This reflex for L5 is not elicitable in all patients, hence its absence may not be meaningful. However, presence on the uninvolved side and absence on the involved side is excellent evidence for an L5 nerve root lesion. I have found that frequently reinforcement is necessary in order to elicit this reflex. Medial hamstring reflex. The medial hamstrings can also be tested, but it is probably not an isolated L5 nerve root because of its multiple root innervation. The examiner's fingers are pressed against the medial hamstring tendons where they are readily palpable behind the knee. The fingers are struck with the reflex hammer and the presence of the reflex can be detected by the examiner's fingers as well as the visual contraction of the hamstring muscles. Superficial reflexes, abdominal reflex, Premasteric reflex, anal reflex, abdominal reflex. Each quadrant is stroked by the end of the reflex hammer. The movement of the umbilicus is towards the quadrant that was stroked, and this designates the presence of the reflex. Premasteric reflex. The inner side of the thigh is stroked with the end of the reflex hammer. With an intact cremasteric reflex, the scrotum on that side is pulled upwards by the cremasteric muscle. Anal reflex. The perianal skin is touched and the anal sphincter muscles should contract, denoting the presence of this superficial reflex, also called the anal wink. Pathological reflexes. Babinski test. Oppenheim test, Babinski test. Stroke the plantar surface of the foot along the lateral border and across the forefoot with a pointed instrument. In the normal patient, the toes plantar flex, but in the positive test suggesting the presence of a pathological reflex, the big toe will extend and the lesser toes may splay and plantar flex. Occasionally, patients are so ticklish that the examiner must use another method to try and elicit the Babinski response. This is called the Oppenheim test. The examiner runs the fingernail along the crest of the tibia, eliciting an upgoing big toe and plantar flexion of the minor toes denotes the presence of a pathological reflex. Test to detect meningeal irritation or space occupying lesions in the spinal cord. Koenig test. The patient lies in the supine position and places the hands behind the head and forcibly flexes the head onto the chest. A response of pain and its localization may be suggestive of meningeal irritation. Test to detect 
increased intrathecal pressure. Pain produced by maneuvers which increase intraspinal fluid pressure may suggest intrathecal or extrathecal pathology. Milgram test, Nafziger test, Valsalva maneuver test, Milgram test. The patient lies supine on the examining table and is asked to raise both legs about two inches off the table. The ability to hold the legs in this position for 30 seconds or longer without pain suggests that intrathecal pathology may be ruled out. Nafziger test. Gently compress the jugular veins bilaterally for about 10 seconds. Then ask the patient to cough. Production of pain in the low back region is suggestive of pathology. Valsalva maneuver test. Forced expiration with the closed glottis increases the intraspinal fluid pressure. The reproduction of back and or leg pain suggests pathology. Special tests related to the neurological examination. As mentioned previously, the neurological examination, especially the sensory and motor aspects, are quite subjective, relying on the patient's response for sensory determination and on patient cooperation for motor function testing. In order to determine if a patient is cooperating fully with the examiner, the Hoover test and the Waddell tests may be used. Hoover test. With the patient lying supine, place the hands under the patient's heels and ask the patient to elevate one leg off the table. If the patient is really trying, there will be downward pressure on the opposite heel, which can be detected by the examiner. Lack of any downward pressure suggests that the patient is not trying to cooperate fully with the examiner. Waddell tests. Tenderness, superficial, non-anatomic. Superficial tenderness to light pinch overlying the distribution of the primary posterior ramus of an involved nerve root is not uncommon. But superficial tenderness over a wide distribution of the low back region is unlikely to be due to an organic lesion. Likewise, tenderness to deep palpation, often extending to the thoracic spine sacrum and pelvis cannot be accounted for by an organic lesion of the lumbar spine. Simulation tests. Axial loading, false rotation. The patient perceives that the lumbar spine is being stressed when in fact it is not, and therefore reports of increased low back pain suggest a non-organic influence. Vertical loading by compressing the occiput is unlikely to aggravate lumbar pain from an organic lesion. Neck pain, however, from occipital loading suggests organic cervical pathology. Rotational movements of the lumbar spine may cause increased low back pain, but when the pelvis and shoulders are passively rotated by the examiner, reports of increased low back pain suggest a non-organic component. The production of leg pain, however, during this examination may occur with nerve root irritation and should not be discounted. Distraction tests. A positive physical finding elicited during the examination is checked when the patient's attention is distracted. If the patient had limited straight leg raising in the sitting position, then this test is repeated while the examiner distracts the patient's attention by performing the plantar reflex and also assessing the extent of straight leg raising. Significant improvement of straight leg raising with distraction suggests a functional component. Regional disturbances. Sensory weakness. The finding of sensory disturbances over a stocking distribution rather than a recognized dermatomal pattern or a diffuse motor weakness of the cogwheel nature or partial giving way 
which cannot be explained on a neuroanatomical basis suggests functional overlay. However, patients with multiple root involvement, as in spinal stenosis or cauda equina lesions, may exhibit these regional disturbances, which have an organic basis. Overreaction. Excessive verbalization or exaggerated facial expressions, muscle tension, tremor, posturing, or collapsing may also suggest a functional component to the patient's complaints. All of these tests to assess patient cooperation should be assessed during the examination of the lumbar spine and neurological examination of the lower extremities. And if non-organic signs are found, a detailed psychosocial assessment is indicated. This concludes the detailed examination of the lumbar spine and neurological examination of the lower extremities. Thank you.